pray with me. Turn to your Bibles. I want to pray Psalm 58. Uh, let me see. Andrina, I can't see this to turn it on. You got it. Thank you, precious Lord. Do you indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Father, does the congregation speak unrighteousness? Do we judge uprightly, we sons of men? Do we work in our heart wickedness? what we do in the earth. Father, the wicked, the ungodly, they are estranged from you from the womb. Father, they go astray as soon as they are born speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the death adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of Charmers, and Lord, you know them. Charming never so wisely. They continually attack. They continually do wickedness. They continually hurt. Most holy, wise, eternal Father, King, eternal, immortal, break the teeth, O oh God, in their wretched, ungodly mouth. Break the teeth, their ability to hurt and the harm and the do wickedness to your people. Break out the teeth of the young lion, most high God. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows at us, Lord, let them be cut in pieces. As a snail that melt, let every one of them pass away. Let every one of them that are out to destroy us, to destroy your way, to destroy your kingdom, to stop your kingdom rule, let them melt away, whether it be in our society, in so far as schools are concerned, in so far as our enemies, in so far as the different kind of isms in the world, Marxism, socialism, whether it's Republican, Democrat, or even preachers that don't do your holy and righteous word, break their teeth in their mouth. When they bring their arrows to go against your word, let them break off. Let them be like a snail that melt away. Let them be like a, a untimely birth of a woman. Let them be like miscarried dead, that they may not see the sun. Lord, before your pots, let them feel thorns. He can take them away as the whirlwind, both the living and his wrath. Do it, Lord. But let your, let your righteous rejoice. Let your righteous rejoice when they see vengeance. Let them stop being weak. Let them stop not knowing that this is war. Let them be strong in their joy. Like they were when Moses and the people of Israel sung the song when you destroyed Pharaoh and his army. Let us wash our feet in the cleansing blood of the wicked. Let us wash our feet as we trample over what has happened to us and what is happening to different ones that love you. Let us walk on it. And thus, let our feet be cleansed. Just like you had your apostle Paul to say, Satan should shortly be under our feet. Father, let man say, let man go up and say, verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, truly, you are a God that is judge in the earth. Amen. We need to learn how to pray. We need to stop asking God to bless everybody. There are some people that need to be damned. There are some people that have dead set their mind on wiping us out as a people, wiping out the people of God, destroying every bit of God's culture in the world, and we don't understand it as war. I don't care what your preacher talk. Can you read? Can you read? When you can read, you ought to be able to understand who overrides this world. 
whether it's the preacher, whether it's me or any other person that sits before you, we must come to the place that we either understand what we're doing for God or why don't we go make some money? Why don't we go rest? Why don't we go sleep? Why don't we go do something else? Why don't we go join a party that will be down forever and give us a modicum of joy unless we're going to be what God wants us to be? Let's quit calling his name because when I get to the second commandment, do not take his name in vain. Well, the third commandment, do not take his name in vain. You will find that what you do when you call yourself following God, Yahweh Elohim, and you're not really following him according to what he says. You are putting yourself in a damnable position to be destroyed. Oh, I know they call you into the church when you die, no matter how you live, or they call you into the chapel at the funeral home and the preacher gets up and says, And the Lord, and the Lord said, Ah, oh, Mary, don't you weep. Mary, don't you weep. Uh, your brother Lazarus will be alive again. And, and, and I see Miss, I see Miss Wilson be walking up there getting her, getting her wings. It's a goddamnable lie. You never find in the Bible anywhere where you get wings when you die. Quit quoting this a wonderful life TV show. When you hear a bell ring, somebody get wings. We don't need wings when we get our eternal body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 says, Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. Luke chapter 24, verse 39, when the Lord appeared on the boat and they were afraid, they thought they saw a ghost. They thought they saw a spirit. He says, handle me. You know, most times black people say, don't handle me. But this time I need you to understand who I am. Handle me. For a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me to have. Don't get it confused with 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where it says flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He didn't say flesh and blood. He said flesh and bone. We're continuing today on our series, The Ten Commandments. We want to know if they're still relevant. We want to know if they're still authoritative. And we have not finished the first commandment. And someone might say, when will we finish the first commandment? Does it matter? Does it matter if we don't finish the first commandment today and you don't know what the first commandment is about? Or I haven't taught what the first commandment is about. I haven't shown how the Lord Christ used the first commandment. I haven't shown yet how the apostles used the commandment. I need to un help us to understand that these 10 words, that's what it is, 10 to bar, are 10 words. I need us to understand what they mean so that we will not fall short. Remember now, if we fall short of the glory of God, it's not because we can't can't reach the glory of God. Quit telling people all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, talking something that's out of turn, whereas the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 1, I believe it is around 27, that Christ is supposed to be in us, the hope of glory. Once Christ is in you, you are not short of the glory of God. You have reached the ultimate of the glory of God. And therefore, when you have Christ in you, the hope of the glory of God, you will have his laws written in your hearts. And in your mind. And the problem is with most people, they don't understand because the bastardization and the weakness of teaching, the weakness of teaching. People teach down to where people already are, but from coming out of school, from coming out of the neighborhood, from coming off of drugs, and from coming off of everything else, and we teaching people down to where they are, looking at an audience and determining, I can't teach that because they won't understand. Since when did God tailor his message to the level of where people are instead of giving them his word and they have to ascend to where he is? And the Bible talks about in Psalm 24, who shall ascend unto the mountain? King James says hill, but the word is heart in Hebrew. Who shall attend? Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall dwell in his holy place? He that has clean hands. And a pure heart. How are you going to get a pure heart unless God give it to you? They have not lifted up his soul to vanity nor sworn deceitfully. What are we going to do? We're going to go in and talk some more about the first commandment. So our topic for today in dealing with the first commandment is this. Is the first commandment eternal? 
Is the first commandment eternal? You see, because if it's eternal, I don't have to just talk about was the first commandment valid way back then. I don't have to talk about is it valid now. I don't even have to talk about when did it become valid. All I have to do really is show that it's valid. Am I, cor am I correct? Is that a correct assumption? If it's eternal, it's eternal. Now listen to what the word of God says. In Exodus chapter 20, let's look at this first beautiful commandment again. And Yahweh God spake these words, saying, I am Yahweh Elohim, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. In other words, I'm God. I'm in control. Nobody can stop my hand from freeing you from your oppressor. I'm the one that did it. Don't you ever give the credit to another God. Don't you ever give the credit to yourself. Thou shalt have no other gods or Elohim, spiritual beings. I don't care if you watch the Black Panther and you see them raise people from the dead and they're talking to the dead. Those are Elohim. Those are spirits. I don't care if it's Baal. I don't care if it's Molech. I don't care if it's Zeus. I don't care if it's Thor. I don't care if it's any of the gods of the ancient and near eastern culture. I don't care if it's any of the multiplicity of deities that I have in my book, Dictionary of Deities in the Ancient World. And they look like there are thousands of them. I used to hear Dr. Ravi Zachariah says there's millions in India. Have no other God before me. Is that commandment eternal? How do we even look at the first commandment? Let's start looking at some Bible. Can we do some Bible study? Or are we able to do some Bible study? Because if we're not able to do any Bible study right now, then what I'll do is this will just be a lecture. But if we can do some Bible study, let's flip to our Bibles or scroll down the page on your iPad or your telephone or however you do it. Or if, if you're one of those kind of people that have it inscribed in your mind, go back in your mind to Matthew 22, verse 37. We're getting ready to go into the word of God. It's going to be good. It's going to be sweet. And it doesn't mean you're going to like it. Am I supposed to care? Listen to this. Listen to this. I didn't really come here to preach to you or to teach to you to make you happy. I came to teach to you for the most high God. I didn't come to give you a man-centered theology. I would be dead. The, I was in this building one day preaching on a Sunday. I was invited to preach. And I looked at a man. He looked kind of big, looked kind of strong in the Gary. I said, I remember when I used to I used to live in the gym or however it was I said it. I said, but I realized like the Bible say, the grass wither and the flower fades. So is man in all his glory. The grass withers and the flower fades away. But the word of our God stands forever. Somebody might say, but Tim, I ain't ever lost my musculature. I never lost my fitness. Well, wait till they put you in the, in the box like they've done many athletes that died early in, in life. And then let's go back five years later and let's, let's, let's exhume you and let's see did you wither like the Bible say. The grass withered and the flower faded. So is man in all of his glory. The grass wither and the flower faded away, but the word of our God stands forever. And we better learn to like it, and we better learn to love it. If we don't learn to like it and love it, it will be the thing that condemns us and brings us down so low that we'll be in pain. And you don't want to be in pain like that, do you? I know I don't. Listen to what the word of God. When we talk and we look at I don't make that noise. That's, that's the... Uh, some, you know, when the computer wants to give you some kind of update, I don't want to hear that noise. I don't even want to hear a little bit of it. Right now, I just want to hear the word of God. Why are y'all laughing at Tim? Does anybody have that? I want you to, I want somebody to read that for me. Matthew 22 and 37, please. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first now, when you see that the Messiah, Jesus says, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He said that is the what, Gary? This is the first and great commandment. That is the first and great commandment. 
Doesn't that sound differently than what we just read? Have no other gods before me. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's not the exact same words. So can you imagine somebody read that? And he says, you shall love Yahweh, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul. And he says, this is the first great and great commandment. Now, either he didn't know what he was talking about, or he did know what he was talking about. And he is telling you that the equity, the power, the thrust, the, the, the essence of that first commandment is this. To love Yahweh. In other words, having no other God before him is showing that you love him. That you are loyal to him. But we need to know what loving him is. If the first and great commandment is the love of God, then when we look back in Exodus, where he said, you shall have no other God before me, that commandment is still in effect while Yeshua, Yahashua, Jesus is on the earth. Because we do have a group of people that say, when Jesus came, he did away with the Ten Commandments. And he says, the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all, notice who he says, the law and the prophets. Now you either hang them on the law and the prophets and get rid of them and say they're nothing, or you're going to hang them on the law and the prophets and fulfill it. That I mean, those are your two options. Either you hang all of it on the law and the prophets and say it means nothing to me, it's not eternal. Or you hang it all on there and you begin to understand and try to understand what it meant. Therefore, I'm going to work from that premise. Listen to me. How is it that we can say that the Ten Commandments are no longer valid and the Son of God just said all of the law and the prophets is the first and the second great commandment. And keeping his commandment is what he told his disciples to tell the world. Matthew 28, I believe, is in 18. Go ye into all the world. He told them to teach all nations to observe, to observe what I have commanded you. Didn't he say that? Am I, am I making it up? If this is what he said, the first and great commandment is, go and you teach all nations to observe all that I command you to do. And lo, I am with you even until the end of the age. Listen to what the Bible says. Here is a question I have for you. How does Yahweh demand and judge what love is for him? If he says, love God, fulfill the first and greatest commandment, we ought to get an idea of what love is. Would you agree? Even if you don't agree, I'm going to agree for my, with myself. Let's look at 1 John chapter 5. Here's one of the apostles that should have been around when Messiah gave that. There's also a recording of that same thing in Luke chapter 7, but I didn't want to read that one. I believe it's 7 and 25, but I'm giving you a chance to pull it up. In 1 John 2, I mean 5 verse 2, John the Apostle says, by this we know that we love the children of God. Now notice, this is a flipping. First commandment is what? Love God and keep his commandment. Second is like him, love your neighbor as yourself. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. I would submit to you, without any shame in my mind, with any doubt in my heart, that this is showing that from the apostles, for those that don't like the beautiful Hebrew scriptures that they would quote from, that this man that would be with the Lord's Christ, and this man that's commissioned by the Lord's Christ to go out and teach, and those that would hear him, the Messiah said, you hear me, Matthew chapter 10, I'm not going to read it. But here is the point. He is saying that this is the love of God, not how you feel, 
Not that you got baptized in the name of Jesus, and I'm not denigrating that. Not that you go and speak another language, I'm not denigrating that. But you can do all of that according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You can speak with tongues of men and of angels and are not have God's love, and you're nothing but a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. You can give your body to be burned. You can feed all the poor that you ever want to feed. You can understand all mysteries. You can quote more scriptures than I do. But if you don't have that kind of that love of God, you're nothing. You don't have the love of God defined walking and working in you. You're nothing. John says, by this, we know that we love the children of God, but we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. The first one and the second one. What do the first and second one entail? I say it entails all ten. And his commandments is not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. There's many things in this world that keep you from keeping his commandments. And I'm going to show you in a minute that they tried to keep the Son of God from keeping the commandments. There are many things, but if you love God, you keep his commandment, you will overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our faith that Yahweh would do what he says, like he says. John chapter 14 reiterates this. When he says, love God and keep his commandments, the first commandment is to love him. Second is like unto him. We're dealing with the first commandment. The first commandment, I say, is wrapped up in loving God. So when we get to don't make an idol, don't make an image, don't take his name in vain, and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And even when we come down to honor your father and mother, I would say even a part of that, honor your father and your mother will go back to the first commandment. But the first four with specificity deals with God. And in order for you to keep all four, the first four, you got to love God. And the only way you can do show that you love him is keep his commandments. You don't have, you don't have to accept what I say. It's still true. It's still true. John 14 and 21 says, he that hath my commandments. Notice, people act like Yahashua Jesus. Or Joshua Jesus. That, that same thing as the Hebrew name for Jesus. They act like he came and killed God the Father who was mean and harsh and all of that. And he gave us the way of license for immorality and made him the minister of sin. The question we're dealing with right now is how does Yahweh demand and judge love for him? I'm saying it again because I, I got some people here that we talk about these things after class sometimes. How does he demand? We love him and keep his commandments. That's how he defines love for him. Number 14 and 12 of uh, uh, 14 and 12 of John says, He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loveth me. That's how he defines love for him. Uh, 1421. Did I say something differently? I just messed up and I'm glad you I said it right the first time, then I messed up. See that with a multitude of words stuff can slip in, can't it? Yeah. In John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said, if a man loved me, if, if, do you all know anything about masks? I know Naomi does because she helped me with an issue I was dealing with on how to charge somebody and figure out what I need to do. To, I need a formula. Well, here's, they have a thing called axioms. Those are supposed to be things that are true. It's supposed to just be a, a self-evident truth or a truth that doesn't change. Am I right, Miss Naomi? You, you're not with me? Axioms. Are they supposed to be truths that don't change? Self-evident truth? Whatever you're doing, math? Okay, if you don't know, they, they told us that. Because we use the word axiomatic when it's not dealing with math. But here's the truth right here's the truth right here. Jesus is given an axiom. He said, if a man loved me, he will. Keep my word. He that, listen, if a man love me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. You will keep the first commandment. You will not make another God before you him. And I'm going to tell you now, making another God doesn't mean going and making an idol. You're not letting anything else be the way you determine life. You're not letting anybody else's laws determine how you're going to live. If it goes against God because the God of something controls it, it makes the laws. 
That's why the states show that we will make laws for you to kill your babies. We can make laws to hang you black people. We can make laws to say it's okay for somebody to come in your house and shoot you and not even try them for the death penalty because we have exercised the right as God. We can determine when life will be taken. We can determine when life will be spared. We will determine what a crime is. I will submit to you that is what God has given us as humans. He has given us the ability by making us in his image to have dominion. But when we take that dominion and we go outside of the will of God, we become a beast. Let me say it slowly. When we take the dominion authority that the most high God has given us and we appropriate it, we steal it and we use it for ourselves, we become a beast. When Adam went against the commandment of God, he went from having his glorious color. I believe Adam was colored in light. I'm not saying I don't believe he didn't have black. Nobody ever had to believe me. But let me let me give you this for free. Moses goes up into the mountain and can I say hangs with God or he's around God for 40 days. Doesn't have to eat food, you all, because the most high kept him sustained. He didn't drink water for 40 days because the most high kept him sustained. I bet he didn't even lose weight. But when he came down from the mountain, Something was different about his face. It was glowing. It was glowing and the people couldn't stand to look at it. I want to ask you this. Let's think in your speech. If you have a sanctified mind, think in it. If you don't have a sanctified mind, use your logical mind. Moses had sinned before. Moses had been exposed to all those gods and around wicked people. He had at least been tainted by that culture. And he was with God 40 days and his skin glowed. How much more then will a man that was created from the dust of the ground by the almighty God and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and became a living soul, why would he not glow? He had never seen. He had never been tainted. Why is it that a man that's a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy till you get to Moses, he's in the presence of God, he's glowing. And the first one did Y'all don't want me to talk about Peter being able to walk on water when he was with Messiah. But I will tell you, Adam named all the animals. <laughs> and some of the animals are not terrestrial. Some animals are aquatic. I believe that when a person is in the presence of the Most High God, that's a beautiful place to be. And listen to what Messiah says in 1423. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Listen, when we love him and keep his commandments, which are not grievous, and keep his word and do what he says, we are going to be able to do things that we weren't able to do before because his power is resident within us. We become his friends. We become his vessels. We become his emissaries. We become his proxies. We become his ambassadors on the earth. And you want to know, is the first commandment eternal? Why would he want to give up the first commandment? The very thing that he says is that it shows my ownership of the world, my ownership of you, and my power over everything that's in it. Well, did Adam have a commandment to keep? You see, when you hear people say, well, Adam was supposed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we know that. But was there any other thing that he was taught? How can he be told to be fruitful and multiply and he don't know what that means? How can he tell to subdue the earth and take dominion over if he doesn't know what that means? How can you name the animals if you haven't been downloaded with a certain amount of information? You've been given Torah. Torah means instruction. As Patrick talked about the other day, Yare, when God shoots his arrows out to give you the information that you can hit the mark that you're supposed to be hitting, God gave information. But let's look and see what Job has to say about the Most High God and Adam. In Job 31. Verse number 33. It's a beautiful one. You might want to write it down. But listen to what Job said about Adam. If I covered my transgressions as Adam. Wait a minute. We thought Adam ate of the fruit of the tree. And that was wrong. Oh, but Job chapter 31, verse number 33. 31. Skip 32 and go to 33. I try to give you a memory link. If I covered 
my transgressions, plural. I hide my transgression as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. Iniquity is the Hebrew word I went. I won. That means he was lawless. Job is saying that Adam did transgressions and that Adam was lawless. Tell him why you don't read the rest of it because I just wanted to make the point that Job, which is considered to be the first book that was written even before Genesis as recorded, Job, not that he was the first person to ever live, because Job is an Edomite, okay? He's from Teman. But the point being made, I believe he's from Teman. Is, there, is anybody seen the difference? Because I'm not going to look it up right now. But anyway, the point being made, Adam had transgression. Again, did Adam have a law to keep? Job 31 and 33, when you look at it and make the inference, you see that he did, and, and Job knew about that Adam sinned. He did transgressions. And he was lawless. If you're lawless, that means you have violated God's law. Don't say it's lawless because there was a there was a law. I mean, there were not a law there, and so you lawless because you don't have a law. Because I'm going to prove that there was a law, and I'm letting you know that it's eternal. Because there are people that teach that there was a time of innocence, and at the time of innocence, we see that Adam sinned. I would submit to you that was that he was. If you're going to say there was a time of innocence, it didn't mean there was a time without law. So you can drive your car all day long and not violate a law. That doesn't mean that there is no law. The law is there. You can still be innocent. He pull you over. I got you tagged. I got you 88. Sir, my vehicle won't go past 88. As a matter of fact, the way it was constructed when they made this, it was made for some child and they won't let it go over 65. Do you really want to... Take me to court with that. Well, let's, let's get out of here, okay? Just because one can think that Adam could have been lawless because there's no law, I'm going to destroy that kind of thought process. How do we know that Adam had law and Torah? When I say law and Torah, I want people to start thinking when they see law, Torah, or instruction. I want to just say instruction. But if somebody look it up, they may not see instructions. So in order to teach, we got to get this thing out of our mind that we can be lawless. It says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, listen to it. I want we're talking about is the first commandment, eternal. And now I'm dealing with what did it exist from the very beginning. I would say that it does, for number one, because it shows God's nature and his character. I believe God's nature and character is eternal. Verse 15, and Yahweh God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. How are you going to do that if you hadn't taught him? If I take you somewhere, Patrick, and I say, I want you to, I want you to dress this facility up for a wedding. And you've never done it before. Wouldn't that be absurd? Now, Adam got to dress and keep the land. And verse 16, and Yahweh God, Yahweh Elohim, commanded the man, saith, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Two things here. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, how does Adam know what that is? How does Adam know what eating is? The Bible never told us Adam ate. I'm just trying to help us to understand. Just like when Bezaliel and Aholiab, they had work to do. God gave them the ability to build all of that stuff and construct all of that stuff for the Ark of the Covenant that they hadn't seen. Moses is the one that saw the pattern in the mouth. Moses gave the instruction to them, and they built. God said, I'm going to give them the ability to do that. That's his way. Adam, I've given you the ability to know what you need to do. But notice this. This is very important. Please. Haven't you ever heard people say, Adam ate and he didn't die immediately? I want to submit to you all that Adam ate, and according to what I see right here, again, for my young people, what is the penalty for being lawless before God? What is the penalty of being, being sinful? Romans 8, I'm sorry, Romans 6, verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. Now, 
when Adam ate and he said, thou shalt surely die, I submit to you that what we don't get in that is that Adam is not just one person. Adam is a representative of people. When you know anything about the Bible, for those that have been in the Bible for a while, you know that there was a man called the high priest. He had a breastplate with different jewels on it. And then he had ouches, King James called it ouches, on his shoulder with the name of the 12 tribes. When that man wore that uniform, that uniform represented all of the people of God. Christ being our high priest, he represents us. I would submit to you that Adam, in breaking the first commandment, he calls all of us to die. So when people say he didn't really die, Adam is a public person. Adam is a representative of all people. Let's look and see if the Bible validates what I'm saying, and let's see if God's law is eternal. Romans chapter 5, please. Paul is going to talk about it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, if the wages of sin is death, listen again to Romans 5 and 12, whereas by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Wait a minute. Death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Is that saying all have sinned after Adam? Or is it saying all have sinned in Adam? There are some that haven't been born yet. There were some that haven't been born since this may have been written around 80, 50, something like that. I wasn't born. But it says all have sinned. Listen, he's going to make it clear. Verse 13. It's important for you to know this. I want you to know how is it that we know that the world was condemned by Adam? It says, for until the law, sin was in the world. Until the law, until what we call the law of Moses, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. There is no sin that is affixed to a person. There is no sin that a person has done if there is no law. Please hear me. There is no such thing as sin if there is no law. Are you with me? This is Paul's argument. For all, for until the law, sin was in the world. He said it was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. And he's saying, how is sin in the world then? Listen to verse 14. Here is his answer. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Nevertheless, the penalty for sin, it reigned as king until, from Adam until Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude, or the same way that Adam's transgression was, who was a figure of him that was to come. Understand this. He said if sin is in the world, then if Adam is the representative, all sin in Adam, and that's why people kept dying from Adam to Moses. There was law. The law is eternal. It may be hard to grasp. Maybe one of the other translations will give it to you easier. But the point being made, no one should have died if there was no law from between Adam to Moses. Was that clear? Because I, I want it to be clear. Thank you, Precious, for telling me it was clear. Because I, I, I really, you know, sometimes people don't ever get to hear these kind of things. And then when you say you teach it over my head, well, then, look, Paul wrote this letter way back then. Paul wrote this letter to a group of people way back then that hadn't even been around 30 years. He wrote Ephesians. He wrote Colossians. He wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians. He wrote the book of Thessalonians to people that hadn't even seen him that long and was telling them about the Lord coming into Trump. Why is it that our preachers get to get away with giving us nothing? Why is it that they send us out on the field not having a good quarterback, not having a good running back, not having good people to catch the ball, or not having good people with the baseball bat to hit the ball, or not giving us a truck or giving us something to plow up the field, yet whenever it's football, they'll say, fire the coach. Get rid of that quarterback. Go get you another tractor. But when it comes to we preachers, why do you all let us get away with giving you nothing? It's because it's not important to you. 
But you don't do that when you pay $100,000 and $50,000 for student loan to go to school. You get what they tell you is good. I'm not saying it's good. You get what they say is good so that you can go get a job. I, I read something funny one day. 30-second version. Many people start businesses and become millionaires and don't have a degree. But then to get a job for those people, you need a degree. You start a business and you don't have a degree and you do well, and some way you get convinced you got to have somebody with a degree to come work for you. I'm not saying a degree is bad, but we'll go get that degree in paperwork, but we won't do it when it comes to God. Is it because nobody gave us curricula? Is it because we decided, we decided mediocrity, it doesn't take all of that? Say it louder. Ain't no grade. Ain't no grade. That's true. When we first started teaching about 17, no, it was about, about 20 years ago. A woman said, am I going to get a certificate? Remember that, Ann? Yeah. She did. I mean, and my wife could have made her a certificate. They look just as good as anybody else. I mean, she could do that graphic kind of stuff, but that would have made her happy. But what if you got a certificate and you don't have a life to back it up? Anyway, listen to verse 15. This is important. How do we know that Jesus really fulfilled the righteousness of this law? How do we know that if man sinned and death passed on everybody because there was a law that was violated, the first commandment was violated, you put something in front of me. How do we know? Because we talk about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So the 15th verse says, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. And don't get that twisted when they say free gift, you do nothing. No, I'm going to explain that free gift because it gets on my nerve when people play with play without. Our hands bubble gumming when we go or walk when we walk around fornicating adulterate doing all kind of stuff that's ungodly mistreating our children mistreating our parents and then we don't even know what to do we go join every activist group trying to get justice in the land and they don't even know what justice is there is no justice unless it comes from the most high god did you hear what i said did i need to slow it down i don't think i did thought i was clear i was clear thank you jesus but as not the offense so also the free gift for through it the offense of one many be dead he said, because of Adam, many be dead, because the wages of sin is death. Adam, all of us were in Adam's loins, okay? When we say his loins, when his sperm came out and impregnated Eve, Eve was pregnant, they had a child, Cain had a child, Abel, I don't know if Abel got to have one, Seth had children, he had other sons and daughters, and it keeps going that way, seed to seed to seed. That's why when you hear people, I can't get past the begats in the fire. Okay, then you got a problem. It doesn't matter to you. I guarantee you if I gave you $50,000 to get past the big ass, you'd get past them today. But through the offense, one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which by one man, which by one man, Jesus Christ is abounded to many. What he's saying is, Adam condemned the gift of grace. We're talking about the son being the gift of grace. Don't get it twisted. Don't think you got some kind of abstract thing. No, this is the son. That's the gift of grace. Jesus Christ, he abounded to many. 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift for the judgment by one to condemnation. When you get to Romans 8 and say, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, he's talking about the same thing he's talking about here in chapter 5. Adam brought condemnation on the world. Christ in Christ in Messiah, there is a freeness from the condemnation because you're going to now, you're going to keep his commandments. His commandments are not grievous. You're going to honor the first commandment. You will have no other God before him. You will not make a graven image. You will not take his name in vain. You will not mess up the Sabbath day. You will keep it holy. So he says, not as by one that sinned, so, so also is the gift of judgment by one, the condemnation. Adam gave you a gift. For the judgment by one, condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses to justification. He's going to explain it in easy talk now. For if by one man's offense reigned death by one, the kingdom of death reigned over man. Much more, they which receive the abundance of grace of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. What is he saying? 
death reigned. We said, Adam, the day you eat, you'll die. That was for all of us. We don't see that in Genesis. We don't see that in Genesis. Adam tainted the whole mankind by his sin, and we all became dead. We became separated from God. Get out of God. Get out of Eden. Get out. And he put the cherubim up there with flaming swords. So now man, he goes out, he's created in the image of God, he's given power to rule, he's given power to reign, name the animals, he's given power to have dominion, to exercise dominion, to beautify the garden, and now he's going to be clothed with skins like an animal. He's going to clothe Adam with skins. That's why he starts to look like a beast. He's covered with animal skins. Nebuchadnezzar, God gave him a whole lot of power. Nebuchadnezzar got wicked. God made him like a beast. The Bible tells us even in Peter, we become brute beasts. The Bible tells us in Isaiah, preachers become like greedy dogs. And they become like dogs that won't bark, won't tell you the truth. The Bible call you goat. And then the Bible says some of us are like sheep. We become like animals. When you take his power, and you appropriate it for yourself. You make yourself of what you feel the first commandment. And you move from sonship to bestiality. And I don't talk, I'm not talking about the kind where they have sex with the animals, but you become bestial. But men will practice bestiality. It's all in the Bible. We're not talking about that today. I want to keep your mind elevated in as much as I can. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 45, Paul mentions it again. Is this first commandment eternal? I showed you that Adam had the first commandment. He was not to have another God. He was not supposed to put anything above God. He did. It doesn't matter if it was his own thought, but he did. Job said that you violated, you translated, and you had iniquity. The Bible showed that he gave you these authorities, and Paul came and said he's put all of us under the death penalty. And that was after Christ had come. He said, we're still there. That's why it says in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation. There is no more death penalty on them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not up in the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life, see, the law of the spirit of life. Christ came, paid the penalty. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made us free from Adam's transgression, breaking the first law. It made us free from the law of sin and death. But what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, what could Adam do? What could Adam do to change you? Another reason it was weak through the flesh, I'll show you in a minute. It was weak through the flesh. God sent in his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, in his body. It's important that we see that. Because Adam was a man. Christ had to be a man. If God is going to condemn everybody through one man, he, he has set the precedent that I can redeem everybody through one man. Adam B. was the, what they call the federal head. He was a representation of, of what was to come. Christ, the last Adam, some people call him the second, but the Bible says last. The last man, he is able to do the same thing on a spiritual level. So let's look at it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. As it is written, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. The first man, Adam, was a living soul. Genesis 2 and 7, he breathed into his nostril the breath of life and then became a living soul. Was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. If you read, I think it's Romans 1 and 5 or 1 and 7. He was of the seed of David and declared to be the son of God with power by resurrection of the dead. Yeah, he did. Verse 46, how be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. For well, the first man is of the earth, earthy, the second is the Lord from heaven. And as it is the earthy, as is the earthy, so are they that are earthy, and is the heavenly, such as they as heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. The point being made is, is because we are in the image of God, we are also in the image of Adam. Adam was our predecessor. Adam was our, you could say Adam was our template insofar as the flesh. Christ came. He came and he took on the template of Adam insofar as fleshly, 
but the template of God in being spiritual. We bore the image of Adam, and we had death. Now we have the opportunity by following God's righteous commandments as they're explained by his son, as they're explained by the apostles, to bear the image of the heavenly. We must be again born from above. Didn't he say the Lord is heaven? He's from above. Born again is not the real word. The word is the Greek word is anapin from above. So we've been born of the flesh. We born that. But she told Nicodemus, third chapter John, unless you're born from above, you won't even see the kingdom of God. That's why some people, they don't ever want to rule and reign with God. They just want to be rebellious and practice witchcraft. Yeah, witchcraft. In other words, I'm going to get caught up in the rapture. I don't want to get bothered with all of this. Well, the Bible says rebellion is witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You want to keep waiting on the rapture and not do God's will? You don't want to rule and reign? We're supposed to be reigning in life through Christ. We're supposed to be reigning in life through Christ. The death penalty is gone. What's our problem? Rebellion, laziness, and I don't want to say stupidity, so I'm not going to say it. So now, since I've shown that Adam did die, Adam did have a law, I believe I've established that there was a law that was way before Moses. I just read Moses' story. We dealt with Moses last week. I want us to understand why this first commandment is so important. I want us to understand how it is that this Messiah, Jesus, fits in that. So if we will, take your Bible to the first book. Oh, bless God's everlasting name. And let's go to Genesis 15 and 17. I want to show why Jesus had to die. I've said it before. I'll probably say it again. I want it to be just as easy for you to remember as you remember John 3.16. Because these are passages that I grew up in church and never had explained. These are passages that I listened to radio preachers for years and never heard explained. But they need to be explained because they're foundational. So the question for our young people is this. Why did Jesus have to die since he did not sin? If the wages of sin is the death, that's what we just covered. Why did Jesus have to die? I'm going to answer that. Genesis chapter 15 and 7, listen to what the Bible says. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit. What does this mean? Abraham wanted to have a child. God had promised him a child. He didn't have a child. All this time he's going on without it. And Abraham's concerned. I don't have a child. Verse 8. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know it? And he said unto thee, unto him, take thee a heifer of three years old. Take thee a she-goat of three years old. And a ram of three years old. And a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Five different types of animals. And he took them, all of these, and divided them in the midst. It doesn't tell you that he told him to take them and cut them up and separate them. Obviously, he must have told him that. But we don't get the whole conversation. In the words of the Christian prince, let's don't be a stupid. So he took the animals and he divided the big ones, the goat. He took the goat, the ram, and he took the heifer and he split those, but he didn't do the pigeon. Verse 10. And he took all of these and divided them in the midst, in, you know, in the midst, opened them up in the middle and laid each piece against another. And the virgin divided not when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. When there was something coming to mess up the covenant, to eat up the animals, to drink the blood, he drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep, a deep sleep, tardima, the kind of sleep that Adam had whenever a rib was taken out of him. A deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. I often wonder if this is the same kind of darkness that they had in Egypt. They could be felt. And he said, notice, a deep sleep has fallen on him. But does that matter to Yahweh? I can talk to you in deep sleep. I can talk to you if you're dead. You don't know me like that. Learn who I am. A deep sleep fell on him and said, no of a surety. A surety. I want you to understand this. I want you to know and I want this to be something in your cognitive mind that your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. Did you hear that? Because they are my seed. Your seed is my seed. I'm going to judge. This 
It's gonna be good. It's gonna be a good. Y'all gonna sing. Y'all gonna be rich. The descendants. As I say, I know what happened afterwards. It says, and afterwards they shall come out with great substance. Listen, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried. Notice he didn't say you're gonna go into the grave. You shall go to your fathers in peace. Your ancestors. When you die, you can go be with your ancestors, not while you're walking around living. He says, in good old age, but please listen to these next two verses, very important. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity, the lawlessness of the Amorite is not yet full. How does the Amorite have lawlessness if they've never heard of the law of God? How do they have iniquity? Because law had already been given to Adam. They knew the law of God. They knew of God. Although they mixed in other things and did other things, they were still accountable to God. You better hear me. He says the iniquity, the lawlessness of the Amorite is not yet full, and it will come to pass. He said when it came to pass, this is very important. If you don't highlight anything else, if you want to understand the Bible, understand God's righteous law and understand Jesus, Messiah. Listen to this verse. And it came to pass, when the sun went down, it was dark. And behold, a what? Somebody read, tell me what it was. Say it loud. A smoking furnace. That's one. And a what? Okay, two different things. A smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between the pieces. So you got animal shed, blood shed, and a covenant is being made, and that covenant because blood is shed, whichever one of you break this covenant, you're going to be done like this animal. You're going to be put to death. Now, Abraham is in a deep sleep, but notice what it says. It says, a burning lamp had passed between the pieces, but 18 ought to, ought to be a startling thing to you. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, unto thy seed, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. How is it that Yahweh God made a covenant with Abraham and Abraham asleep? The burning lamp and the furnace went through. I submit to you one of those represented Yahweh God and the other in substitutionary form represented Abraham. Now you can say that God made the covenant with him after he woke up, but that doesn't, it, that doesn't, you still got the lamp and the furnace going between the animals. Going between the animals is important. I would submit to you that what Yahweh was doing is showing that if you break the covenant, if you break this covenant, I'll take the death penalty for you. Because I'm going to set it up that all is going to be in my son. I'm going to let you know that it's imperative. It's important for you to understand that keeping my commandments are so important that I will send my son to die. And he will be the new head of the race of people. It's legal, but it's beautiful. All of the animals and the animal sacrifices were pointing back to the substitution. But don't get it twisted. They had already been doing animal sacrifices before then. But this is a special one. Again, why did Jesus have to die if he did not sin? It's because he had already entered in the covenant with Abraham before he took on the human body. Get it? This is so important because other than that, you will be thinking, well, you know, we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. The law is invalid. If that's the case, why did he have to die? Why did he have to die? There should have been another way to get rid of Adam's sin. There should have been another way to redeem the world. Listen to how Jesus went through and listen to see how important the first commandment is to him. Chapter 4 and 1. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1. Then was Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards hungry. Okay? Let's get to the point that I want to be. When the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. If you be of the same nature and character of God the Father, command and make these stones bread. Notice his answer. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. What was the word that he gave them in the first commandment? You shall have no other God before me. You shall have no other God before me. I would submit to you when he says every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, I would submit to you that the Ten Commandments 
when we go through chapter 21, 22, 23, which will be really easy after we do the background preliminary work because I didn't really get to see it going up and I want to make sure that we get it. We see those 10 words, don't take his name in vain and we've already dealt with, we're dealing with right now the first one, don't have another God before me, don't make a graven image, remember the Sabbath day, don't kill, don't steal, don't murder, don't covet, don't bear false witness. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word, every word that he gave in that once is suspended in his statutory laws and his covenants, we will learn how to rule this world, we will learn how to reign in this world, and we will live by that, we will have the harmony and have his protection. And he said, what you talking about, the man that these stones be made bread? That's not where the power is, feeding people. That's not where the power is, the power in living. That don't make the people live because I feed them. You ought to read John chapter 6 sometime on your own when the people kept following him for food. He said, labor not for the meat to perish. What we need to do is see in John 6 and 63, he said, it's the spirit that quickeneth. It's the spirit that quickeneth. It gives life. The flesh profit nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. What words are you going to speak? He said in John chapter 8, he says in John chapter 8, I don't speak my own words. He speaks the words of the Father that sent me. So the devil taking him in verse 5 to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For I know the Bible. I can quote it and tell you. For it is written, He'll give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands. Can you believe in the miracle, Jesus? Can you believe in the miracle? Can you believe in your father? In their hands, they shall bear thee up, lest at any time you just dash your foot against the stone. But Jesus said unto him, not only do I know the Bible, I know you've taken it out of context. I see that you have twisted it. I see that you're trying to make me have an authority and just have what I say to come out of my mouth, even if it's not what God's word say, and to do it and to say it anyway and go against God's holy commandment. Jesus said it's also written. This is why you need to know the Bible. Folks, quote you a scripture. You don't they got 10 cent worth of Bible and trying to buy your Porsche. That's like going to the, uh, the buffet. You got two nickels and you want to get a plate for there and one to take home. This is not one of those churches that they're trying to get you to join and you get to go there and you never go and you go get something to eat and get a plate and take one home. We're talking about the word of God now. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. You don't put me to the test to try to make me prove something to you. You're going to declare and decree something, and it's got to happen because you say it. Or you're going to go and you're going to just have faith. I'm going to have faith. I'm going to quit my job, and I'm going to be a preacher. And nobody, you don't know what the world you're talking about. You don't know anything about God's word. Nobody ever listened to you. And you, you know, you might do well in this society, but you're not doing God's word. I saw Joel Osteen's first sermon. I didn't know what that was. I, I felt sorry for, I did, I did with many, many years ago. Now, now I feel disgust when I hear that kind of man. But I ain't going to talk about that right now. It says, and he says you shall not tempt. We better learn how to answer people when they say, you know, God say love everybody. No, he doesn't. He doesn't tell us that we got to love everybody in totality. When you read the whole scripture, you see in Psalm 15, it says, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. Now, if you say that he say love everybody, and you understand the context, like when he said he'll dash your foot against the sun, it's also written that you don't tempt the Lord your God. That's what the devil said, right? So if you're going to tell me God say love everybody, you better define love the way the Bible says it. Because now if you define it the way the Bible says it, I can love you, rebuke you. I can love you and put you away from an assembly. I can love you and move you because love is that you get put away from an assembly, not because we hate you. We actually want you to turn. We want you to turn back. Why do you think he put them out of Israel? Not because he hated them. Leviticus 26 said, I'm going to put you out. Deuteronomy 28 through 30 said, I'm going to put you out. Some of you may die. Yes. But I can send back a refined people. They'll listen to my word. Verse number. This is the beautiful. It says that again, verse 8, he takes him to a high mountain and showed all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. All of the kingdoms. All the kingdoms have his. All the kingdoms have the kingdom of God. 
Okay, you talk about all those kingdoms in that region. Said he shows them to him. And the glory of them, and it says, all these will I give thee if you will fall down and worship me. You think he doesn't give kingdoms now? You, you really don't think that some of these people that promote pedophilia, murder of babies in the womb, lies, debauchery, transgender, trans this, you in, and all of this, that's the kingdoms of the world. Look at the kingdoms of the world. He says, I will give them to you if you bow down and worship me. I've heard people in the music industry, I've heard people in the uh, entertainment industry and different ones, they say if we do such and such a thing or those that did do those, those people get to get up and they be famous. Sometimes you see people famous and you know they don't sing that well. You know they're not that great an actor. They look like they're struggling and they memorize their line, but they get to be elevated. Why? Because of the fact they bow down. But here's another thing. Not only do they bow down, but they use them. You ever wonder why sometimes people are advocating certain things where you bow down, and when we get ready to use you, we'll use you to promote whether it's pedophilia, homosexuality, adultery, debauchery, uh, making fun of the Lord's Christ, or to speak against presidents. I don't care what side it is. So what? Yeah, they definitely say go vote. How you gonna tell me to go vote? I'm a grown man. I don't need you to tell me how to vote. I can read. I was reading at age three. I don't need you to demand to me to vote. I don't need you to vote. Is it going to make me closer to God? Is it going to give, is it, listen, if you go from the Black Panther movie, is it going to mean when I vote, is, are the people that are our oppressors, are our white brothers going to give us the vibranium so that we can be equal with them? No. We're not going to be equal. And you make it. You've taught us in our schools and you've taught us in our colleges that make us so weak and so debauched in our mind that you could present, I don't know how many people was on the Democratic thing, and all of those people that was differently that differently going against they, we want men up there kissing, and you're going to say, you gonna, we're going to give this to you and you vote. And then you give us Donald Trump, and you're going to say, we got to vote for him. You gave us that. Tim, you hate Donald Trump? No, but I'm telling you, that's not who I would have chosen. You made fun of Ben Carson. You call him Uncle Tom because you don't know what Uncle Tom was. You would be good to be the good man that Uncle Tom was, that he was doing things to protect the women to keep them from being beaten. But uh, Sambo beat uh, Uncle Tom till he died and listened to Simon Legree. But I don't want to talk about that book right now. He says, if you fall down and worship me, I give it to you. Thank you can get a promotion on your job, Gary, if you did. Some of any and everything that they would want you to do. They could get promotion in this world, Patrick, if you go and become a useful idiot, whether it's for the mob, whether it's for gangsters, whatever, whether it's for an activist group. Well, listen to what Jesus said. Then Jesus said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is also written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thy serve. Notice the way this thing is set up. It's set up to the first commandment. That goes back to the first commandment. First of all, I'm not making bread to get the people to follow me. I'm going to give them God's word. The ten words of the ten commandments. I'm not going to tempt God. Why would I tempt God? He said, don't tempt him. And then you're going to tell me to bow down to you. The first commandment says, him only, God, yeah, you serve. Obviously, he saw it as eternal. Well, is that not our pattern? Didn't the Bible tell us we are to follow in his steps? Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth? But how is that working out in our lives? Go with me, if you will, to Hebrews 8 and 8. Because we need to understand that that first commandment is eternal. It was done by the Lord Christ. Paul taught the people that, you know what, he did it. And he set the way for us to follow. But in Hebrews 8 and 8, listen, you, if, if you follow with me closely, you're going to learn something. Some people say, well, go over their head. But all they got to do is listen to it two or three times and read the context. In Hebrews 8 and 8, the Bible is talking about Moses' law. Understand this. Moses' law was never to be eternal. That, that, would be, that would go against God's law that he had already had. It was to go back and say what God's law was. Follow me? If you understand that, you'll understand when people say that Moses' law, we're not under that law, you would understand that that's true. But there's another law that comes with Christ. 
as he is the lawgiver. Genesis 49, 10 through 12. I'm not going to read it. Listen to what it says. For finding fault with them, the people, he said, Behold, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. That covenant that he made that they broke, you got to take your mind back to when that smoking lamp and furnace was going between the animals. God had already consigned himself that if this covenant is broken, I'm going to pay the price. So this is what's taking place here. Listen to verse 10. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. When the Bible talks about the last days, a lot of times it's talking about this. After those days that I'm going to remove the, the what he called the Aaronic priesthood, and I'm going to give it the priesthood of Christ. I'm going to remove that, and I'm going to put you under the covenant of the one that died for you, yet rise from the dead, keeping that covenant promise that he made with Abraham. Now, I'm not only going to do that, I'm going to keep that where the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. I'm going to keep that. I'm going to keep what I said, what Jeremiah was said here, but I'm also going to keep what Jacob said. This person is going to be king. He's going to reign in life, and you're going to reign with him. You should no longer be walking around, being under everybody else, and thinking you always got to be oppressed. You got to always be on your habits. You got to always be wicked. You got to always be under the penalty of death. I come to make you soldiers. I came to give you life. I came to make you kings. I came to make you priests. I didn't come for you just to sing and roll on the floor. Dang, we we missing the mark. Well, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind. My laws in their mind. This is God talking. I will write them in their hearts and will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. We're not going to put it on the doorpost anymore because that was a picture of it being in everywhere you go. When you come in your home, my laws rule. And on your frontless, they will make them put it on their head. That's called frontless. So that it will be in your mind. They will be put on your wrist for what you do. But they were still external. They were still external. But that was a picture. Now I'm going to write them in your hearts. I'm going to write them in your minds. I'm going to write them in your hearts. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. And we know they're alive because they're out of the death penalty, according to Romans chapter 5. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother. Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Preachers are supposed to be teaching. You're supposed to be reading on your own. You're supposed to know him. John 17 and 3 says, John chapter 17, verse 3 says, This is life eternal, that they know you the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You know God by knowing his word. You know him by knowing the character of his word. You want to talk about no justice, no peace? Until you know God's word, you don't know what justice is. You make up your own as you go. And he says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquity will I remember no more. How is that? It's because Ezekiel chapter 18 not Ezekiel, Jer yeah, e Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 33, and Jeremiah chapter 18. Again, Ezekiel chapter 33, Ezekiel chapter 18 talks about when a wicked man turned from his righteous, I mean wickedness, God said, I won't remember their iniquity anymore. I'm not going to hold it against them. But if they turn from their righteousness, I won't remember any righteousness that they've done. It's the same thing in Jeremiah chapter 18. That's why I did that. But I said, let me slow it down. And it says, in that a new covenant, he has made the first old. I want to read you this because I'm ready to slow it down now and get out. In the 10th chapter of Hebrews, I skipped 10, 15, and 17. I wanted to read that. But I let 8 suffice for that. But Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28, because people say that now that you're in Christ, it's easier. I want to, I want to get rid of that God damnable, ratchet, rancid lie. Hebrews 10, touch my I don't like that computer to make noise when I'm working. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Got it? Of how much sore punishment. You think it's easier under Christ just because you've been taught incorrectly. You think grace under Christ makes it easier? Listen to what he says. Of how much sore 
punishment. S-O-R-E-R. -E we could just say worse punishment. Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and have took people pleading the dead gun blood, right? And have took the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified as an unholy thing. You pleading the blood while you doing debauchery? You pleading the blood while you cheating on your husband? You do you you pleading the blood while you lying on your children? You pleading the blood while you faking a Christian? You pleading the blood while you out here practicing homosexuality, pedophilia, bisexuality? You pleading the blood while you stealing from people? That's a damnable thing. That's a listen. That's a maledictory thing. That's a blood covenant. Moses sprinkled the people with blood. I showed you all back when we were in Exodus uh, chapter 24. Now Christ died, his blood is shed, and his blood cleanses us, but it will also damn us. But you got people saying the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, what saint always says. Why did this man not know this? I find more theology in the writer of the book of Hebrews than any living man that I know. I don't even come close. It says, of how much store of punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified as an unholy thing and have done despite the spirit of grace. Do you hear me? You got the spirit of grace and you still trodden under the sun. Do you know how damn they, that's damnable? For we know him. This is how the writer writes. Let me change my voice. For we know him. That have said, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. See, if you don't know anything about his glittering sword, if you don't know anything about people's foot being about to slip into the pit, you don't know nothing about vengeance being his. And then it says, it's a fearful thing. Didn't it say fearful? That's what it says, to fall into the hands of the living God. And when it says fearful, it's not talking about respect. It's talking about dreadful. But call to remember. In the former days, after you were illuminated, you endured a great flight of affliction. What he was doing is going through and showing the people, you went through a lot for this cause. And he tells them in verse 35, don't cast away your confidence. You're not going to go without opposition. The Lord's Christ went through opposition, and we went through opposition. We'll go through opposition. Let me tell you what I didn't get to today. I didn't get to the fact that when we talk about this being Christ freeing us from death and death not having reign over us and that we're supposed to reign in life, how is it then so many of us that call ourselves following God, we're going to separate the day of the dead. The day of the dead, which is coming up, I think it's this month, Halloween, Holy Eve. How is it we're going to go and worship on the day of the dead just like they did in the movie Black Panther, just like the Druids did, the Day of the Dead, Hallow's Eve or Halloween, and all of the witchcraft and the things that go on, and we call ourselves following God. He has freed us from death. Yes, I got the information. I just want to at least get it out there. Just get enough of you get to get a taste. I didn't get to get to um, where God showed explicitly those that follow his law will rule the world and that other people would come to them. I will show what I, I, I had to show, and I didn't get to it because of time that it happened that when Solomon was following God, people came to him to learn. The Queen of Sheba came, and when David was in charge, they came to him. And then the last thing I wanted to deal with is how God's law is mandated on the world. But all of it comes from the first commandment. If you get the first commandment wrong, you don't get any other one right. That's the anchor. That's the anchor. Let me change my voice. This is the anchor. If you don't have Yahweh God as your only God, as your only source of right, as your only source that you bow down to, then you will never get to the place it doesn't matter whether you take his name in vain or whether you make a make graven image, whether you disrespect the Sabbath, whether you steal or whatever. Everything has to be reconciled in your mind to who he is. And he told them who he was. He said, for you, I mean, although the whole world was just, he said, for you, Israel, I brought you out of Egypt. I did that. I showed you the gods can't touch me. I showed you that the mountains move when I quake. I showed you that the, the water opened up. You know I'm your God. You're not equal to me. Nothing else is equal to me. 
And don't you ever act like it is. And so by the Most High God doing that and showing who he is and showing his power, we begin to understand that that first commandment has always been there. I'm the Lord your God. Have no other gods before me. And so by the time we start talking about other gods and what they do, we have the foundation. There's always been this law. But you have to understand when I start showing other gods, I'm going to show them, I'll show some by name. Then I'm going to show you some by concept. Then I'm going to show you some by your own feelings. Sometimes man let himself rule his God. And if you think I don't know what I'm talking about, I believe it's Romans chapter 1, maybe around 22. It says men took the glory of God and they exchanged it or they changed it for an image of men. Men. They're like men. An image of men. Four-footed beasts and creeping things. You change it. Paul calls it vain philosophy. Once we understand the first commandment, we'll find out we have done so many things that violate the Most High God and we're worthy of death. The Christ says, at the last temptation, I'm going to help you understand, Satan. This is why I answer you like I do. He said, worship the Lord your God, him only shall I serve. So you don't have to ever worry about me. Keep answering your question. Well, I'm not going to turn the stone to bread. That won't keep the people alive. Jumping off the pinnacle of the temple and letting them see a miracle. That, like he said, don't tempt. I honor God. I only worship him. Then you come up with this, I'll give you something. Again, do I have to say it again? He said, worship God, and him only shall you serve. If we are there, then these lessons are just helping us reiterate where we are and to help other people to understand that these laws are important if we're going to build a nation, if we're going to build a kingdom. These eternal laws are what was set up for Israel, and they rule when they followed them. How much more then shall we be able to rule in justice, equity, and peace? The last thing I say on that is because we've learned and we're following the character of God. Look at that. We're following the character of God. That's why we're going to rule. We're gonna, we, we are imitating him in the land. We'll be able to, when people see us, they'll see the Father. Remember, he's spirit, right? They'll see something. Can't they see the devil in people? Yeah, you don't see the devil, devil, but you see the devil. You see his characteristic. Father, thank you for your word. You're powerful. You're righteous. Help us by your mighty, mighty, mighty power to take into consideration what it means to have no other God before you. And as your servant Paul said, though there be many, there be God's many and Lord's many, but to us there is but one God and one Jesus Christ. Help us to serve you righteously so that we can be with those that say the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. Amen. Amen. And even so. Amen. Amen. I open our class for discussion, if there's any discussion to be had, or rebuttal, or clarification. Discussion, rebuttal, or clarification. So I want to try to reiterate basically what you were saying about Genesis 15 and 5. Leave out <clears throat> You're saying that by that covenant, because Abraham was asleep, mm -hmm. the substitution was already there. It was. Because God knew that, like, well, let me say, God knew they were going to mess up, basically. So I already have the built in. It's, I, I'm already, I'm, my, my son is going to come through as the, as the substitute. And so that's what you're saying. Um, that makes sense. That makes sense. Did, did I understand that correctly? You did. What I didn't add to that is this. If you think about it, the writer of Hebrews says explicitly 
that Levi paid tithes in Abraham because he was in his loins. If Levi paid tithes in Abraham because he's in his loins, how much more then if Abraham goes ahead, because this comes right after he meets with Melchizedek, okay, because chapter 14, he meets Melchizedek, and he pays tithes in 14. If Levi paid tithes in uh, in Abraham's loins, you know, in, as a descendant, because Abraham represented the family, that Levi paid tithes in chapter 14, how much more then did Levi enter in the covenant as well with Yahweh when Abraham entered in the covenant? Abraham, Abraham was a father that represented the people. And you'll see sometimes God say, I don't do this for you all, Israel. Not because you're Jewish. I don't do I do it because of the Father. And sometimes I used to think, well, what did they do so good? I don't know a whole lot of good Asher did. I don't know a whole lot of good Gad did. And maybe they did a lot and it's not recorded. But they were in the loins of Abraham, the father. And so when he did that, the substitutionary part of him having to come and die is that you, you've you already done it for the children of Israel. Remember, it's quite amazing. It sticks out now why John 1 and 10 said he came to his own. His own received him not. That's who I made covenant with. I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Those that I made covenant with. Romans chapter 3, when it talks about what advantage have the Jews over anybody else? He said, much. And in every way. Because then they were given the covenants and the promises. But Acts, I mean, Ephesians chapter 2, can you tell the Ephesians, you were strangers from the covenants of the promise. The promises in singular. So all that goes into what he did with Abraham. And that's why they again to rule. They go out into the and they teach people to observe all that I command you to do. They are the ones that send it out. So when you say he came into his own, he's not. He, he's talking. He's, he's talking about the Hebrew people, the right. Israelites. Okay. Remember in Romans chapter eleven, Paul talks again. He talks about an olive tree. Right. Like, look, y'all other people. I mean, Yahweh loves you. He let you be a part, but you don't bear them. Get your chest, get your chest out, get your chest out from over your nose. Is it pumped up that high? You got a face mask with your chest, boasting. No, uh, uh. -uh. Understand? They bear you. You don't bear them. Everything was to them because of Deuteronomy thirty-two and eight. Well, not because, but it's iterated there where it says, "When the Most High El Elyon separated the nations, He did according to the children of Israel." But that is not what the Dead Sea Scrolls say. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the ESV says, to the sons of God. According to the sons of God, he did that. And then uh, the, the Septuagint says, according to the angels of God, they use the word Malak. But the point being made, he separated them. He did it according to the sons of God. For instance, all of the nations were under different deities or different Elohim. Of the eight, I think it's the 17th or the 18th verse of Deuteronomy 32. It said they didn't worship God, they worshiped demons, but they were the Shadim. Right. So Yahweh took Israel to be his inheritance. So it was it was God had all the nations versus one. So God God's taking a handicap. Satan, you got all these nations. You got every single one of them. I got one. And with this one. Listen to this. I'm going to show you how much dominion is mentioned in that. When he said, through you, Abraham, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. What does the Bible say? The lesser is blessed of the what? Greater. <laughs> Abraham, your seed is going to be greater than all of these. Your seed will have the ability to bless. So he came to that group. This is the one I made covenant with. And so the other people, you get to come into the covenant in the same type manner. But you got to listen. You got to listen to what my son said. You want to enter into this covenant? It's going to be by his blood. Don't play with it. Don't play with the blood. You plead the blood and you wicked? You you shouldn't do that. 
It's almost like being, it's almost like being in the lodge, and you're gonna plead the the oath in the lodge, and you'll be telling all the secrets. Really, really, you better ask Joseph Smith. I think they said Captain Morgan too. You better if you don't. In words of black people, when I was young, you don't know. You better ask somebody. <laughs> I tried to get to see if anybody on the conference live want to share, I mean, on the Facebook want to share our message. But go ahead, anything else? Was, was I clear, Gary? You were. Was there any, was there any unclearness there? I don't know. I mean, we had to These are the animals. This just represents the animals. Okay, these are the animals. When you walk between this, this is bloodshed. This is saying you're going to die if you break this covenant. There's a lamp and a furnace going through. See? I think when you say the bloodshed, because yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking of other people sometimes. How will they hear what you're saying? By nature, the fact that it's, it's that when you kill an animal, you cut an animal in half, there's going to be blood all over the place. Okay. And that's where they used to do covenants in the old world. You and I are going to make a covenant, do something. We're going to get an animal, we cut it open. And you break, you break that covenant, You if it's that kind of covenant, you, you just get put to death. We're going to have witnesses. He broke the covenant. Put you to death. That, you said he broke the covenant. You mean Abraham, Abraham, if, you, if you and I did a covenant, a blood covenant, a maledictory, a covenant with a curse in it, it's for our good, but if the one breaks and let the other one down, he gets put to death. That's the kind of covenant that it was. And so Israel is the one to sin. But they were in the loins with Abraham when he made the covenant. So he goes through their substitution in a substitutionary fashion for them. So he died. But somebody said, but he did it for the whole world. Well, he said, Abraham, through you, all families of the earth will be blessed. It was never just for Israel. That's a damnable lie when people say that. It was never just for Israel. It was always for the whole world. The whole world was his. And still is his. That was, that what David said. David knew what he was talking about. He said, the earth is Yahweh, or the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so once we start seeing that, then how can you compare the Christ to the Buddha, to Muhammad, Zoro or Zero Aster? Talk about seed, yeah. How can you compare him to the Dalai Lama or to your pastor or Tim Mary? How are you going to say you can do greater works than him and you thinking because you can raise somebody from the, if you can raise somebody from the dead, you can roll on the floor. You Even if you can move a mountain, you can speak in 50 different tongues and you don't have an interpreter and nobody can say amen. If you do have an interpreter and they can say amen, how you think you're doing greater when you can't go do that covenant? You can't say nobody through your death like that. You might, you might Somebody might be saved because of it or you save their human life. But the thing is, doing greater is he came to one group of people, the one that he had made covenant with. He has other extenuating plans for the other people that we would live in such a way and that they would hear God's word and they would come in from the aisles. They would come in from other places. They would bring their gifts and they would come to know God. This is what, the, what it's talking about when they say you are the light of the world. You are the city of this set on the hill. Let your light possess it. Your light shine before men. That's another group. Your light men that they that they, those people, may see your personal group works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Why are they glorifying your Father which is in heaven? Obviously, you can either glorify him because of his mighty works which he's done, or you can see that you're, they're glorifying your Father because they have determined that we want to be a part of it, like Rahab the harlot, like Tamar the pretended harlot did. She pretended. I want, I want some of that blessing. And give me how God blessed her. God blessed her so much so that she got to be in the line of the Christ. Well, she did. Because Perez and Zara came from that, you know, when she sold her body to her father in law to keep the Leverite vow, which was not even listed as a Leverite vow. A lot of things they did that we see that there was 
truth and a law already there, but it just wasn't written on tables of stone. They already knew it was wrong to murder. Look at how God dealt with Cain. How is Cain in trouble if there's no law? But sometimes we do like we did. But when I first when I first went to college, and they say, "Uh uh, you you have to take these classes. You don't make inferences. Put me in remedial reading. Hurt my feelings. Hurt my feelings so badly. I was so I was so disgusted. I mean, because I'm reading. I mean, because I can read the words. I I know how to syllabicate. I know how to syllabicate. I know how to look up words. But they say you don't make inferences. Yeah, Miss Purdy was my teacher. Told me you're going to be in this class a whole year. I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Now you to take this big, fat, unabridged dictionary. We didn't have computers back then. And I'd look up the words. There'd be words in the frequency of maybe so many in a million, so many in a hundred thousand, so and I learned those words. And I learned after a period of time, I think differently. I got more tools to work with. And so sometimes I see that people still read like I did, and you just see what you can't you can't make the inference. Why is it that Cain is in trouble for killing if there's no law? Then Paul comes and says, Well, there's no law. There's no transgression, there's no sin. Cain was scared he's gonna be put to death. Why? If there's no we begin to learn we don't get everything, every conversation that was in the Bible. If we did, most folks wouldn't, wouldn't read it anyway. They ain't know the one piece. Yeah, but don't a lot of people read that. Any more comments? I think it's interesting how you're talking about when you can become peaceful when in that same passage with death of those animals you see all the animals can you speak from. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about it, but if you just go there talking about well, you mentioned Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. you, you, you mentioned They were. And so you've got animals coming to ruin or they do what they do. But I just thought, okay, see, how does it get sent? You know, they don't read in the Bible. And it just made me think, okay, if people can be peaceful, then they 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 con they conjugate their their it's death. It's just it's all death. So I, I had thought about it so seeing that this is a sacrifice. You know, when we, when, when we are dead to uh, ourselves, we're alive as what? But the, the beast, the image that stuck out to me, like I gave her over to the man who was a baby. That, that was, um, that image was acknowledging by the way you were explaining it. Okay. I'll, I'll give you something for free. You're teaching the book of Jeremiah. Israel became like what he called a wild ass dromedary, shaking her butt, traversing as she goes, wanting, any, wanting anybody to come and mount her. Isn't that Jeremiah 2? Chapter 2? This is where they ought to read the whole daggone book. Then he called them one time a backsliding heifer. Then he called them that? I mean, this is Yahweh. You you like a beast. See, many say you like wild you like wild poison grapes. Mm -hmm. Yes, beast in Daniel. We we don't we don't understand so many times. Yahweh says things in so many ways so I can finally get you to get the aha moment and see yourself. You remember in Ezekiel 23, he said you're the kind of whore that you you like horses issue. You like the sperm of horses because there's a lot of it because people that sell it will tell you it's a lot of it. And then you say you like donkey's fallacies. Yeah, he did. He said, you, you wide open hole. And not only are you a wide open whore, he said in the 16th chapter, you so filthy and nasty, you go pay people to lay up with you. I guess you, I guess you could say Israel was a cougar, as they call it. Say other people get paid. You, they get, you pay them. Now, 
which would you which would you rather be considered to be like an animal or a, a hoe, a whore that would like to have donkey phalluses, horse sperm, and you paying people to come be with you, and you neglect the God of your the God of your fathers. This is what happened when we turn away from the commandment. We thinking we looking good. I guarantee you, Gary, a lot of those men like Pedaliah and those other people that were living, uh, you you would think they would think that they were great. They look good. They dress well. They probably smelled well. And they made fun of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah said, and they, they made fun of me. Ezekiel, Ezekiel Peach write another song. Ezekiel Peach another sermon. It sounds like a lovely song. Can you imagine the bill wizards have been living back there and been one of them? I'm like, lovely song. Lovely song, lovely, lovely, lovely song. <laughs> I don't have any more comments, so what I'm going to do is. Anybody else? What? You're not, you all talking about Tim? Uh, it's okay. Anybody else? I thank you all for joining me. May Yahweh bless us and keep us. Make his glorious face shine upon us. Help us to have the mindset to really think about what it means to have no other God, no other authority, okay? No other authority above him or even in his face. Man, if we do that, look at the doors that will open, the power that can be given, and how we can glorify his name. Amen. Amen and amen.